Welcome to another episode of the Culver Capital Leadership Podcast. My name is Bradley Hamner, your host. On today's episode, we have Gary Revlin. He is the award-winning journalist who just wrote the book, Saving Main Street, Small Business in the Time of COVID-19. When I saw this book in Barnes & Noble, Saving Main Street, I was like, I'm buying it. I didn't even read the uh, subtitle before I decided to get it. I love all things small business. I really do. I mean, I think you can, hopefully you can tell my enthusiasm and genuine appreciation for small business, small business owners, small businesses. And so when I saw this, I was going to get it. It's a fascinating book. I'm about halfway through it now. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation just a, around his journey about why he decided to, to write this book, some of the stories inside of it. Without further I do. Here's my conversation with Gary. Devlin. So the big question is this, how do small business owners like us grow our leadership, develop our teams and scale our business in a way that allows us to get our products and services out to the world yet still remain profitable? That is the question. And this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Bradley Hamner, and this is the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. Welcome to The Bottom Line, a new weekly podcast series that we drop every Thursday to complement our weekly Monday podcast interviews with the industry leaders. These podcasts are going to be designed to give you short, impactful, and value-driven information that you can start using right away in your business. I value your time and attention and will do my very best not to waste it. Just get what you need and go. So with that, let's get into today's episode. Are you an agency owner looking to grow your revenue, increase your bottom line, and better manage your taxes? Club Capital is here to help. Club Capital is the largest accounting and advisory firm for insurance agents in the country, providing monthly accounting, tax strategy, and CFO services. Way more than bookkeeping and your everyday run-of-the-mill tax prep, Club Capital is focused on providing financial and tax advisory services that help you plan and forecast your agency's performance. Their financial dashboards and agency forecasting tools help you better understand your agency's historical performance, create and measure future targets, and see how your agency compares to your peers around the country. Imagine what it would be like to understand the impact to your bottom line when deciding to hire a new employee or forecast the impact rate changes or commission rates will have on your business. With over $200 million in tracked annual revenue and $140 million in tracked annual expenses, Club Capital has the data and the team to help you make better informed decisions for your agency. They will help you turn that back office stress into the backbone of your agency's success by giving you the tools to take your agency and your leadership to the next level. Visit club.capital today to book a solution overview with one of our business consultants. Club Capital, way more than a CPA firm. Have you ever tried online marketing before and weren't sure if it was working? Maybe your rep talked about all the impressive features and stats and said things were going great, but you didn't know how all that tied into raw new policies written. Well, that's not the case with Direct Clicks. Direct Clicks is the premier Google Ads and SEO option exclusively for State Farm agents. Why? They're 100% resource oriented with an exclusivity guarantee. Every review call you have with your account manager focuses on what really matters to your business, and that's leads and call-ins received. Everything will get broken down to cost per lead received. By investing with direct clicks, you're going to free up time and energy to focus on what's most important in your agency and doing what it is you do best. This will be the best investment you make for your team by spending confidently and scaling your agency today with exclusive online marketing partner, Direct Clicks. Visit us at directclicksinc.com. Gary Revlin, welcome to the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Very excited to have you. So before we dive into the main topic for today, I, I, we always start with just kind of background and origin story. So before we do that, why don't you just share a little bit about your your background, your journey uh, to kind of where you are today? Yeah, so I've been a journalist forever. Um, you know, I just, it's funny, I, I was going to take a year off before law school to do journalism and now I'm 40 years, <laughs> 40 years and counting. Um you know, I've sort of written a little bit about everything, uh, urban politics, machine politics in Chicago. Uh, I covered tech for a long while for Wired than the New York Times. You know, I've written about gambling. I covered Katrina, uh, excuse me, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. So I'm a long time journalist, done the daily thing, written books, uh, magazine pieces, and kind of find new topics, small business you know, once COVID hit. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm always looking for kind of interesting areas rather than most journalists these days tend to be specialists. 
Yeah, that's very true. What, uh, I mean, the obvious of why, you know, with, with COVID, there's so many different angles that you could go with that. Why did you choose Main Street? Why did you choose small business to be able to focus on for the, for the, um, uh, the content for the book? You know, it, it was interesting. About a month into COVID, I was listening to the local public radio station here in New York City, and they had the, a, a congressman on, and a small business owner phoned in. I've been in business for 24 years. I've been through the 2008 recession here in New York, New York City, you know, Hurricane Sandy, recessions, you know, all these different kind of things. But how am I going to survive COVID? Well, my dad was a small business operator his whole life. And, you know, it, it just became personal. The light bulb went off like, huh, how are small businesses going to survive? You know, whether small businesses writ large or the restaurant I love, you know, that toy store, you know, down the block, like how are they going to survive this? And it just seemed like a, a, an important issue. Small businesses were under threat as is, right? You, you have you know, Amazon, the internet, you have big box stores, you have chains. It was increasingly becoming harder and harder and harder to be a small business operator. My, my dad was done in by, you know, the recession of the early 1990s. But I mean, his business was done in um, by uh, the recession in the early 1990s. So I knew how hard it was. And just COVID just seemed like, wow, but how do you deal with, I'm 100% shut down for two months or whatever you yeah. had to control. Yeah. Yeah, and especially, which we'll dive into this, especially if you were not um, uh, life-saving or whatever, like if you were not essential, you know, uh, like a gift shop or something like that, that obviously we'll talk about. It's like, well, no, you're not essential. It's like, well, my team is, my employees are, like my family is, like how am I going to be able to survive? And so, well, why don't you just take us, so, okay, we've got the inspiration we it became personal for you. I think even you just saying that was like, wow, yeah. I mean, you know, my dad's a small business owner. I became a small business owner. I love all things business. And let me just, by the way, counter this. Um, I there's a podcast I love called My First Million, and they love talking about things on uh, you know all the tech scene, Silicon Valley. Uh, raising VC money, p private equity money. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything else. But it almost feels like it exists in a world outside of small business, right? And mm -hmm. so it's like where there's that world and then there's the actual day-to-day -day main street, you know, oh, 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 you're talking about a mom and pop business type thing. Yeah, that, that sort of thing, right? And so it's just kind of like that gets lost and forgotten in day-to-day -day politics, government, and then it also definitely did whenever it came down to Main Street. So you, it became personal for you. Where did you then go? What did you begin to do? And by the way, just to react to what you just said, like, so remember, I, I covered Silicon Valley for a decade plus. And it's true, like, it's almost like 95% of the attention that the mainstream media pays to entrepreneurs are tech startups that are small businesses, at least for a moment. And like, well, what about businesses that don't, you know, have five employees because they want 5,000 employees and be, you know, have the IPO? It's just, it's a restaurant, it's a gift shop. So, you know, that's really where, where I wanted to focus. You know, I, I think this is a travesty. If I had like a magic wand around the small business issue, the one thing I would do is have the U.S. government redefine what it considers a small business. You're a small business in America, according to the U.S. government, if you have up to 500 employees, and there's some exemptions, there's some industries where you could have far more than 500 employees, but like, by what definition is a small business have hundreds of employees and millions in revenue? So it was really important to me that I found true small businesses, you know, totally. two, five, 10, maybe 20. In fact, the restaurant that's at the center of the book, Cusimano's in Old Forge, Pennsylvania, it had 23 employees. I think that's the biggest business um, I wrote about. So, you know, in a book like this, I really want to set it somewhere. I'm in Manhattan. I'm in New York City, the center of New York City. And the issue here is rent, rent, and rent, right? I mean, it's just like they pay so much. So surviving was different in New York City than it would be for most locales around the, the country. I went someplace uh, uh, away from the coast. It's early in COVID. You know, I really wasn't looking forward to flying. I mean, at that point, I couldn't fly. 
Um, and so I thought, well, Pennsylvania, you know, it's a couple hours drive for to northeastern Pennsylvania. That's former coal country. That was interesting to me, these, you know, towns that have been struggling. Um, and so I just started looking for businesses there. And as you point out, you know, the, the, the non-life essential um, uh, ones. And, you know, you correctly say like, well, when you put five or 10 or 20 years of your life into something, you might consider it essential. But, you know, for that moment, you know, government like restaurants, food places, you could stay open or, you know, gift stores, no hardware stores, depending on the state, you know, bicycle stores, depending on the, 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 the state. So I, I really wanted to find businesses that were, were hit hard uh, by, uh, by COVID. And I also wanted diversity. When I say diversity, I mean in every sense of that word, type of business, uh, geographic, rural versus urban, uh, gender, age, race, in this day and age in the U.S., politically, you know, they're on one side of the divide or the other side of the political divide. I just wanted a kind of a, a, a range of views. The idea was to, you know, look at small businesses. They were presented with this enormous, enormous challenge. Predictions early on, you know, a month or two into COVID, if you remember, in 2020, spring of 2020, they're predicting that one out of four small businesses would go under, one out of three. I found a prediction that 40% of independent restaurants would not survive uh, COVID. And so it just seemed really important to be out there and document and see how these various small businesses dealt with the challenge. Ambition is the first step towards success. It's time to level up your agency. And Coach P Consulting will help you do just that by using the same strategies he used to sell over 700 life insurance policies in 2021 alone. Now, this is not your regular one and done type coaching. You'll get personalized coaching two days a week, every week of the month, and you'll get a live look behind the scenes of his team training and an office that's performing at the highest level. There's a reason Coach P Consulting is the fastest growing coaching company for insurance agency owners in the country. Coach P will train your team alongside his own and show you the exact steps they are taking to achieve Chairman Circle, Exotic Travel, and Multi-Line Presence Club, and be one of the few agents to be selected to have a third office. So whether your goal is to be at the top of your local market or amongst the best in the country, this training will give you the strategies and the tactics to get there. For just $250 a month, you'll get high-level coaching each week from someone who is already getting it done at that level, and his strategies work, and it's time to put them to work for you. Sign up at coachpeakconsulting.com and get your first full month for free when you mention the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. I have to tell you, thank you for doing the work. I know it's in the context of COVID. I get it. But still, at the end of the day, though, and I told you before that I've gotten uh, maybe to halfway through the, the book or so, something like that. So I haven't finished it. But like it, 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 it is it, it is important work. It is per deeply personal to me. So thank you for doing the work to get this this message out. And I, I wish you all the best in the success of the book. OK, so let's get down into it. I. Um, just this morning. No, well, actually, uh, this after the mid morning was on a call with someone who a small business owner he had two companies he was a has a healthcare it was actually a nursing home facility they were, he told me he said we were losing $500,000 a month for the first few months into covid and then he had a he said i had a 34,000 square foot facility um and it shut down we didn't survive mm -hmm. and so he was a, it was a, it was a it was a workout place you know and he had put a lot of his capital into it and they just couldn't, they couldn't keep it up. He said, 78% uh, of our of our uh, members called in, left a voicemail and canceled within like, you know, 30 days. And he mm -hmm. said, it was an unraveling of everything I thought I'd built, you know, in my, in my life. And it was like, what, I, I don't even know where this is going to stop, you know? And so luckily they were able to survive through the, uh, uh, through, you know, the, um, uh, with the nursing home facility. But I mean, the other ones didn't survive. And so that's unfortunately been the story for a lot of small businesses around the country. Business is hard enough right. as it is, let alone this coming in. And right. so can you just talk about whenever you first went in, you, you, you got the kind of the backstory of it, but then you start to add these conversations is that how did it come about to choose who you ultimately portrayed in the book? Right. So um, you know, I had a few criteria. I, I 
So there's an amazing stat, uh, I'm sure many people listening know it, that uh, five years, in the, half of small businesses will not survive five years. Um, and so I really wanted survivors. I wanted businesses that had been around uh, for, for, for a while. And so, you know, I, I just wanted like, okay, a fighting chance. They've obviously proven that they can yeah. survive up against the chains or whatever competitors uh, were, were out there. And then, yeah, I don't know, there's something, I, I, I initially did Zoom calls, uh, of, of course. And, you know, I, I was almost like auditions for a, a play or, you know, tryouts for a, a team. I, I reached out to, I think I ended up talking to 60 small businesses. And in the book, there's three main small businesses you follow and another six or eight. Uh, small businesses that are kind of secondary uh, characters. And some of it was that diversity. How do they fit fit together? And some of it was just kind of the, the, the grit, the determination, uh, just the creativity uh, of, 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 of folks. I mean, I didn't realize this when I started, but what I was really excited about, what really got me were folks that were fighting back, you know, mm -hmm. that they really, this is a terrible hand they've been dealt. Like TJ Kuzumano, I've been cooking since he's in the third grade. Uh, he and his wife, Nina, you know, in their 20s, started this Italian restaurant. I've been around for seven or so years at the time of um, uh, COVID. High-end Italian doesn't really lend itself to take out kind of thing. And he tried everything, you know, some things did not work. He tried, you know, meal kits like, you know, Blue Apron. That yeah. proved a bomb. No one really wants to pay his prices to then cook it and clean up after afterwards. But, you know, he did this Italian restaurant. He did Taco Tuesdays. Made a yeah. lot of money yeah. that way, or at least brought in cash uh, at a time when he was, was desperate for cash. He never particularly cared about barbecue, never cared for barbecue, um, but taught himself how to do sudden style barbecue. And every weekend, his restaurant, you know, they just, they sold out barbecue chicken, barbecue pork, the sides and stuff. And again, just brought in several thousand dollars every week at a time when a few thousand dollars was the difference between surviving and not surviving, the difference between paying the rent and the other bills and not being able to, to pay it. And I, I just, I just kind of marvel that whatever the state government threw at him, you know, you can open, but only 50% occupancy. Oh no, it's rising again in the fall of 2020. We're gonna shut you down again uh, for several weeks. We'll, we won't let you do bar takeout. We'll let you do, we'll let people sit at the bar. We'll let you do 50% occupancy, then 75% occupancy. And whatever it was, he just figured a way. And so those are the folks who really drew me. Those are the people I kept on going back to again, and again, and again, and ended up featuring uh, in the book. All right, so it may not be a fair question, but I'm I'm curious of your opinion of this, okay? And I think you'll give you you'll definitely have an opinion, I'm sure. Business is hard, and there are some people that shut down, and some people shut down, and they were already on the edges. They were already on the edges. So now this gave them a convenient excuse. Yeah. Oh, see, see, convenient excuse. I, I, can't, I can't do it. And nobody would blame them, blame them. Nobody would blame them. They'd say, golly, that, that was tough. I'm not saying everybody, but some people. Yeah. And then the reason I'm telling it, bring this up is on the opposite end of the spectrum is the guy that you just mentioned, yeah. creativity. I do not know how to do barbecue. I've never actually really loved barbecue, but I'm going to learn how to cook Southern style barbecue. And I'm going to do whatever it takes until yeah. I run out of ideas. To me, that is a fascinating thing to pluralize and say like, well, what makes this person be so driven, grit, creativity? This person, who's a business owner themselves too, started the company, but the sin says, oh, this is now a convenient excuse. Have you ever thought about that? Like the difference oh, yes. between two personalities? Oh my goodness, yes, yes, yes. So, you know, that just like there are pre-existing conditions that made you more vulnerable health-wise to COVID, there are pre-existing conditions economics-wise. If you were limping, if you were struggling going into COVID, it was much harder to survive 
then you know you you had a, a, a thriving business, or at least a business that was covering uh, expenses. So I told you about T.J. Cusimano. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, Glenda Shoemaker, a uh, gift shop in a rural area in Pennsylvania, second generation. Her, mo her mother uh, had started the store in the 70s. You know, it's like she sells greeting cards and uh, gifts, and she's on the wrong side of every trend, right? I mean, greeting cards, younger generations are not buying greeting cards. There's electronic free uh, alternatives to that. You can just text. Um, you know, gifts, she's competing against the Walmart on the edge of her town. She's competing against the internet and she did not innovate. You know, I mean, in 2020, she did, she had no online presence except for, you know, a Facebook page that she could announce that she's having a sale this week. No one could buy anything. No one could do commerce. And that, of course, really, really hurt for the two, two or so months she was 100% shut down. You know, she did no business. And then once people slowly came out of their show, like they're not sure they is, is it worth it to go to a retail outlet to buy mm -hmm. something? I, I could be safer and just buying online. You know, and in that case, you know, really it was something you don't hear very often. Government work, you know, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, let her survive. You know, it was that was the difference between her having to shut down her store because she couldn't make her bills, couldn't pay the expenses for the product she had on hand and, and her rent and stuff. But she was able to do it because of PPP and, you know, I, I'll give Glenn the credit and sheer determination. You know, that woman just worked seven hours, excuse me, seven days a week, you know, 10 hours a day, if not more. Um, and so she didn't have the innovation, the creativity, I'll try new things. She was kind of stuck in her way. She didn't pivot to use the term, you know, we all use. She said, oh, I should get online. I should get online. And, you know, three years later, she's just still not online. Yeah. You know, but on the other hand, it's it's her baby. It's, you know, her, it's her mom who's still alive, her legacy and mm -hmm. stuff. And so, you know, even on that other side of the spectrum, you know, where you're not facing reality, you're not making the kinds of changes that, you know, podcasts like this, I'm sure are telling you should do about marketing this way or whatever. Um, you know, she, she too survived. You know, it, it was interesting. Far fewer small businesses went under uh, than were predicted. You know, we, we don't have exact numbers, but it seemed like there was a, a few percentage points tick up in the, you know, typical year, Eight to ten percent of small businesses will go out of business. Right. You know, as far as the there was a Fed, Federal Reserve study in 2020, 11, 12 percent uh, went out of uh, went out of business, and that's because of the grit, and determination, and creativity. PPP. It was like there's PPP in a second program, the the Idle program. Add them together. We we gave one trillion dollars. The U.S. government gave one trillion dollars. Uh, to small business. And, you know, PPP was inefficient, inefficient. I could tell you all the things that were wrong with it, but you throw a trillion dollars at a problem and, you know, you're really going to help a lot of, a, a lot of folks. And so it really wasn't the calamity because again, I think there's something about small businesses. Um, there's something about, you know, there's the benefit of, of the federal bailout. And a third factor, I think people with, with COVID, got to appreciate small businesses because they, they could imagine their life without that favorite shop, that favorite restaurant. And so from all these small business owners I was talking to, whether they're featured in the book or I ended up not using them, they all talked about, you know, customers, you know, I'm here shopping because I want you here a year from now. So mm -hmm. fewer customers came in, to, for instance, to Glenda's shop, but the ones who did spent a lot more money because they really wanted that shop to survive. You know, otherwise, what do we have? Just like restaurants on the edge of the highway and, and, and Kmart and the internet. What did you personally learn about small businesses, small business owners that even with your dad uh, being, being a small business owner himself that you didn't know going into it? So, I mean, one fact I didn't appreciate is a famous study from J.P. Morgan Chase they looked at hundreds and thousands of their small business customers. The average small business has 
18 days of reserves on hand. And that, that, it, it just so it reminds me of kind of the stat that, you know, half or so of Americans, you know, are, 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 is, are one or two months away uh, from financial disaster being in, 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 in debt. And it's true for small businesses too. I, I, I knew they were vulnerable. I knew that there were these larger forces that was making it harder for small businesses to survive. I didn't realize how precarious uh, it is. The other thing too is the million small ways the system seems rigged in favor of larger players. We saw with PPP, remember the first round of PPP, they ran out of money within two weeks because all these publicly traded companies figured out a way to apply for money set aside for small businesses. Part of the problem is like, we say small businesses can have hundreds of employees, up to 500 employees. Part of it was an exemption was put into PPP that said, you know, no more than 500 employees per physical location. So all these hotel chains and restaurant chains have thousands and thousands of employees, but no more than 500 in any one place. You know, uh, uh, policies that happened in Pennsylvania, where I focus, but you know, many states did this. Uh, they shut down non-essential businesses, as we've been talking about, but they let the big box stores stay open. So here's a policy that had hundreds and hundreds of people congregating in the big box stores because perhaps they sold food, perhaps they sold hardware, they had something essential um, so they could stay open. And yet, you know, you have the the the, the guard the garden uh, flower and garden store is shut down, and they're going to the big box store to buy it instead. It's just like that was a terrible idea. I mean, a small business could have a few people in it at once. They could easily separate people socially distant and all. And so, I, I really think we have to rethink our policies. I really do think our policies um, are slanted in ways we don't even appreciate uh, in favor of the larger players. Everybody's listening to you saying, yes, Gary, yes, we we agree with you completely. And I know you mentioned it, and I want to come back to it. Yeah, I mean, whenever you read the SBA definition, you know, typically 500 or fewer employees, you know, no more than $41 million in top line revenue, you're like, $41 million? Mm -hmm. I do two, or I do one. Like, I, I can't even imagine 40 times. Like, that's not a small business to me. That is like a, that's a sizable company in my hometown, right? If you think about revenue per person and the number of employees at that. And, and, and I, good I, for, agree. Yeah, I mean, good for them. We could talk about a program to help them. They were challenged, of course, yeah, yeah. by COVID Absolutely. too. But like, this was a program for small businesses. Right. Can't we create a small business program that's for small businesses? No more than 50 employees, no more than 100 employees, but, you know, something that, you know, a, a, a definition that more or less all of us can agree is actually a small business. And then let's come up with another program to help medium businesses, and, you know, I, kind I, of totally tailor agree. for that. Yeah, yeah, we're not knocking the business that's been able to go from 2 million to, to, to 25 million or 100 million, like good for you. Yes, absolutely. But to your point, like a lot of the, back to the venture back companies in, in Silicon Valley, it's like you were a small business for about, uh, three months, and then you actually got your funding, and then now you're a hundred million dollar valuation. Not a small business, not at what we're talking about, you know. So yeah, what? Um, so obviously coming, uh, coming out of the pandemic, what are some of the like biggest takeaways? You mentioned one of them, which is cash reserves, and I was curious if, if this was going to come up today. But what are some of the takeaways that you actually feel like are some things where it's like, man, th these are some outside of the uh, character traits of grit, determination, resiliency, those sort of things, which obviously are incredibly important. What are some additional things that you feel like that are almost best practices or things that you've learned that we can all share, uh, not to just prepare for the next pandemic or something, but just in general, mm -hmm. to be able to bend the odds, bend the odds more in our favor as small business owners? Right, I mean, first off, you know, we're talking about retail online presence. I think everyone should have, you know, a more of an online presence. But, you know, I'm sorry, in this day and age, you know, as you point out, yes, for the next pandemic, if when, uh, but just, I, I it, it just seems like there's tables, table stakes, you know, policy changes. I really do think it's important, like, you know, we give lip service to uh, the support of small business. 
on the right, on the left, every politician in between, small business is the backbone of America. Um, you know, we as consumers, we love small businesses, we say, and yet what happens? Every year, the big box stores take a larger percentage of our spending. Amazon, internet-based companies are taking more of our spending. And so, you know, there's a hypocrisy. You know, we fetishize small businesses. We love small businesses. And yet what happens is, you know, most of us support large, large businesses. I think, you know, putting our money where our mouth is. Again, I, I do think that was a, a big plus um, to COVID. Or that's a funny way to put it. There's no plus to COVID. But I think something that came out of it that's a positive is we saw the power and might of the Amazons of the world. And we started to appreciate life without these small businesses. So I guess the optimist in me uh, is hoping that that's, that's a change. And you know, this is something others have uh, reported. I wouldn't be surprised if you've had guests on here talking about it. You know, millions and millions of, of small businesses were started um, in 2021 and 2022. I think it was 5.4 million uh, new small business starts in 2021. Certain per percentage of those are because people laid off, they had no choice, they lost their full-time marketing job, and now they're a small business making a fraction of what they used to make. It's not all good. But you did see this entrepreneurial thing stirred up. You know, they might have had extra money from, you know, lack of spending because they weren't spending on entertainment and travel. Could have been, you know, uh, uh, extra money from the, the U.S. government. And stuff, and so we did see a lot more small businesses. So all those vacant lot, uh, vacant storefronts, because businesses went under during COVID, you know, landlords wanted people in there, and they gave them good prices, and they started their business. So you know, there there, there are kind of the shoots growing out of the cement uh, that have me feeling you know positive uh, about small business looking forward. Mm shoots running coming out of the concrete i think everybody likes it i can i get that visual and i think that that makes a lot of sense yeah because i'll ask people on the podcast from time to time what is something that you feel like was positive or something that good came out of covid for you personally and that's again you know there's been a lot of tragedy in people's personal lives and that's not to diminish any of that by no stretch of the imagination in the lives that were lost etc but then, you know, there are some deeply moving things that have also happened within our businesses, or our teams, or even just how we've been able to connect back to our families, or we did connect back to our families. Um, when wait, you, wait, wait, but, but yeah. before we get off that, you know, I, something I did miss is there were there, there are businesses that are now better run today yes. because they went through the experience of COVID. I, I, I think of you know two examples from. The book, there's these three chocolate makers in the Bronx. There's, you know, only one maker, you know, rather than retail or a restaurant that I focus in. It's the only place outside of Northeastern Pennsylvania. And, you know, they, they've done 90% of their sales. They make chocolate bars, um, high quality dark chocolate bars. And 90% of their business was to retail. You know, they, they sold, sold to, to, to stores, specialty shops, uh, Whole Foods. Uh, some of them pick up, um, sell their, their chocolates. And with COVID, that really snapped shut. And so they started doing corporate sales. Hmm. Um, they started doing more, to, more direct to consumers and stuff. And now they have a healthier business because things have reverted on the retail side. They, you know, that, that, that business come back. But now it's about half retail. And the other half is a combination of direct sales through their website um, and corporate uh, sales. They're stronger now because of it. There was a small cafe in Hazleton, a city of 30,000 in Northeastern Pennsylvania, once a strong coal region, a uh, coal city, coal dried up. They really struggled. They were coming back when COVID hit. And she had this popular cafe in the middle of town, but you know, that did not, the office workers, you know, still haven't come back in the same numbers. And she started doing catering. She came up with this idea of boards, like uh, uh, gift baskets, essentially, but on a, a, cutting, a cutting board. And she ended up selling the cafe to a someone younger who wants to try a cafe. The shoots coming up to the cement, um, and now she just got a kitchen on the edge of town for much less. And she's a caterer, and she's doing a really healthy, good business. 
um, as a caterer and doing these gift baskets and other products like that. And, you know, she just, she changed, she morphed, she pivoted. Again, let's pick on Silicon Valley. We celebrate that in Silicon Valley. Like, oh, they could pivot. They're so creative. Like that kind of creativity is going around everywhere. They're just not really talking about it in the business section. Well, exactly. But you didn't make TechCrunch. You didn't make TechCrunch because Mark Andreessen didn't invest in your company. But the reality is you pivoted and you just added half a million dollars in top line revenue and uh, 40% of gross margins to your family. And you just helped employ two people that right. changed their life that got them out of $12 an hour jobs. Now they're making $75,000 a year. Like that's a significant change. And those stories are just not told enough, right? Yeah. Because again, it doesn't hit tech crunch, which again, nothing wrong with that. But there's just like the broader economy is way bigger than just your app startup that you just that you just created. Right, 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 right. It, it is funny. We love small businesses, but we especially love small businesses with dreams of becoming huge businesses. Yeah, um, right, you know. right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, what What are your thoughts about over the next, uh, pull your, your crystal ball out a little bit, but where do you see things? I mean, we're, we're now, okay, so come out of COVID, now we're just hitting interest rates obviously we've got possibly very likely an impending uh, recession that 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 could occur this year i mean nobody really knows where do you what do you see as much resiliency determination creativity that's happening man small businesses just are, seem to be under fire constantly from the barrage of things that they're dealing with let alone competition online etc that's happening and it's happening at a faster pace. Yeah, I'm, 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 I am a bit scared. I, you know, that the point of the book almost is, you know, all these small businesses survive so they can get back to the fight they'd always been fighting against the change yeah. and the I, what better funded competitors and all that. But, you know, there's something broken uh, in the economy of small businesses and we see it through labor. You know, so all these small businesses, you know, they had been paying their employees 10, 12, whatever, $14 an hour. But now, you know, Walmart's paying 16 or 17 or 18. Amazon, the fulfillment center is paying 16, 17 or 18. And so I think this is going to be a short-lived problem that take a few months before the economy kind of uh, worked itself out. But it's not. I mean, these small businesses I wrote about, they still have problems. Uh, finding employees because their economics don't quite work paying the 17 or 18 or 20 an hour yep. that the larger businesses are able to pay or have to pay uh, to get their employees. So that really makes me uh, nervous. Uh, there was a, a, a hair salon was, was one of the main businesses mm -hmm. uh, in, in the book, a, a Latina immigrant a uh, woman, she always had eight employees or for years she's had eight employees. She can't get employees number seven or eight anymore. And so everyone's working harder. She's, you know, trying to make do, you know, she can't handle as much business because she doesn't have uh, the employees. And, you know, she will hire someone, but they'll get hired away for more money. So, so that really does have me uh, nervous uh, for, for a lot of these small businesses because there's a real employee um, problems, real hiring problem uh, right now that, again, I thought it was like, oh, a summer of 2021 thing, but here it is January of 2023, um, and we, we still have that problem. Have you heard of the, or do you know, familiar with the Bucky's gas stations? I know, where's that? Uh, I think it started in Texas. Some people listening to this are probably like, oh my gosh, Bucky's, I mean, there are these massive gas stations. I mean, I think the, the one in Athens, Alabama, about 30 minutes from here that opened up on the interstate uh, has 250 gas pumps. I mean, it is just this, oh, oh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Look it up, look it up, Bucky's, B-U-C-C-E-E-S, I guess. And uh, it started in Texas, everything's bigger. I mean, and, and they'll advertise They'll advertise. They have super clean bathrooms, like very, very clean bathrooms, and they've got just food galore. Anyway, it's 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 a whole experience. I mean, it's like a destination. People will not stop at certain gas stations to wait fifty miles to go to Bucky's. Okay, here's the reason I'm telling you this. 
telling you this is because when the one closer, the closest to me opened, they had a sign out front and it said starting pay $17 an hour. It was like 17 to $21 an hour. And if you were like a general manager, you made $150,000. And if you were the, no, no, no. If you were one of the managers made between like 125, and 150, if you were the general manager of the whole thing, you made a quarter of a million dollars. I was like, what in the world? Holy smokes. And I sent this to some several business owners to say like, wow, this is what you're competing with, right? And so, I mean, I, I, somebody working at a gas station now it's $17 an hour. Hey, good for them. Great for them. But now you have to look at it and say, how does this affect me? The work may not be, what we do may be more meaningful. Or you may feel like it's more meaningful. Yeah, but for that person that's saying, gosh, I can go make this on these hours, that 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 starts putting a, a lot of wage pressure um, on, on the small business owner in that area. Yeah, no, I, I again, I, I, I see it. Uh, you know, in, in the towns I was writing about, literally there was a Walmart, sa same story as you're saying about Bucky's. You know, they had a huge sign in front of the Walmart, you know, starting pay at 16 an hour. Again, that's great. I, I 16 an hour, that's what, $32,000 a year or so, yep. under 35. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 we do need a living wage. Um, but I also saw, in fact, the, the, the cafe owner I was talking about, um, part of the reason she had to close the cafe, she could never get any employees. Hmm. You know, it was a cafe. It's a 10 or 12 buck an hour kind of job. And she used to have, you know, college kids working part time, that kind of thing. But no, they can make a lot more money at the big chains. And in her in her area, uh, it was the, um, the fulfillment center. So you've got, um, you know, Amazon and Michael's, the art supply. And they too, you know, Amazon, there, there were flyers. I'd, I'd go you know, I'd visit the town to do my reporting and they'd have flyers like $500 bonus. I went a few months later to, to, to sign up, I know, hiring bonus, $1,000 hiring bonus. I went back again and we'll pay for some college. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, and we have healthcare benefits. And again, these yeah. are all really good things. But if you're a small business operator who's been living on a shoestring, you've got 18 days of, you know, cash in the bank. And it's been barely working at twelve dollars an hour. You know, going up to sixteen dollars an hour that changes the whole economics uh, of it. You could charge more, but that's the problem. Like you're a small business, you're already charging more. You know, you exactly. Walmart, the Walgreens, the the internet is 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 underselling you, and maybe people want to support you, but if you have to charge that much more for your product because you're getting it at a higher price, you're buying it from a middle person you know, rather than directly like a Walmart would do, you know, it's just like, it's yet more pressure on these small businesses. Um, and I, 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 you asked me before what surprised me. I don't know how some of these small businesses survive. I don't know why they do it. It's just like work for someone else. It's their headache. Get your salary, a good week or a bad week. Doesn't make a difference. I get the same paycheck, you know, every, you know, every week, every other week and stuff. But Everyone dreams of small business. I, you know, I quit a job at the New York Times to be a freelancer and do my own books and that kind of stuff. So I don't understand it. It's absurd, and yet I'm doing it too. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it's it's cliche, yes, but it's the American dream. It's the American dream, and it, it's just there's something there's something deeply satisfying. And for look, I can only speak for me, but like I'm unemployable now. I'm unemployable. I mean, I would be the worst employee ever. Okay. Like if somebody offered me X amount of dollar salary, I'd say, I, I can't take it. You don't want to hire me because the, the, the things, the expectations of way of doing things. And so it's like, once you, once you become a business owner, entrepreneur, there's no going back. There's no going back. It's like, no, this is, this is, this is, even if no matter the hours, I'm putting in so many more hours than I ever would. Right. working for a w-2 wage right i just I, I think i think that that's why i think that that's why they're just like no i am going to go down and man you just i just love that spirit i don't know i just love this yeah, spirit. I, I i talk about this a little in the book there, there's something about kind of the american ideal you know that you know we 
we were independent. We were independent farmers, you know, the, 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 the corner druggist, the general store. It's like, it's so central to our narrative. You, you have small business and entrepreneurial energy all across the globe and stuff. But there is something about America that being your own boss, standing up to the establishment and the, no, I want to do it this way. And I don't want to have to answer. I this is the way I think it should. You know, it really does seem kind of essentially American in in in, in many ways. Yeah, good point. Good point. And that's not to say you're, you're you're so right. There is entrepreneurship in that spirit of want to be a business owner around the world, around the globe. Absolutely, but the, it it does seem it does seem to be even even deeper in America. And that's not to say because I haven't ever done the study of what that looks like in entrepreneurship in other parts of uh, other parts of the of the world, for sure. Gary, uh, this has been a great conversation. People want to connect with you, obviously uh, point them to where they can pick up the book. I really recommend um, that they do. It has been a fantastic read for me. Uh, when I saw Saving Main Street, I was like, I'm buying it. I don't even know what the <laughs> subtitle was. I'm buying it. <laughs> uh, but it's been fantastic. So okay, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I guess it would be ironic given the topic for people to buy it at Amazon. Um, you know, Amazon's a bit of the bad guy uh, in the book, but you know, you get it anywhere online, go to your independent bookstore. Go, you know, it's funny. We, yeah. we sent a free book to every bookstore that Harper Collins had in their database that had a main street address. And it turns out there's thousands of, of small business of um, bookstores around the country. Uh, with a Main Street address. So even if it's not Main Street, it's Broad Street or whatever you want to call it, you know, buy your book at at a um, uh, at, at an independent bookseller, you know, support small business. Um, and I have a website, it's just my name, www.garyriblin.com, you know, about saving Main Street, my other books. You can buy it through there. In fact, there's a tab for Amazon, but there's also a tab for, you know, independent booksellers, and they'll kind of arrange for you to buy it from the local shop it could even have it sent from the local shop to your uh to your home awesome awesome gary enjoy the conversation and uh hope to have you back on in the future this was great thank you so much Bradley. well a few takeaways i think one is just the, my reason uh why i love small business owners so much is that they're scrappy the grit determination the resiliency that is just the innate characteristics that's there for all of you that listen to the to this podcast and and so many other people out there. I just love that that spirit as he and I were talking about um, at the very end. And, you know, a big takeaway, I, again, I think practically is just how little reserves. In other words, I, I sometimes refer to that as dry powder. I mean, just coming out of it, say, hey, we need to sit on more dry powder because we don't know, you know, another pandemic, et cetera, that's going to come. We need to be able to, to prepare ourselves so that we're able to survive in the event something like that were to happen, whether again, it's a pandemic or whether it's a recession, et cetera, just the best practice to be able to sit on more cash in the business, cash and, and access to cash, I think was a big takeaway. I would also say this, uh, he and I ended up having a really nice conversation after we hit record around just the differences of where he is in, in Manhattan, where I am and you know, uh, in, in the South and in North Alabama. And, you know, the differences in policy and, and politics, uh, socially, uh, economically, et cetera. And so we had a fascinating discussion uh, uh, about that. I don't talk about politics very often um, in my life, let alone on the podcast. I'm just, that's just not something. And so the reason I bring this up is because it has, I gave this a little bit of thought before I shared it. It's giving me more thought to, you know, maybe I should be not an activist by no means, but maybe I should actually pay more attention and maybe do certain things to help um, influence policy for small businesses. That's not something I've ever done. That's not something I've gotten involved with. Yes, I live in a state that is um, uh, going to be more conservative when it comes to small business policies, et cetera. But it is incredibly important. If small business is in my blood uh, and who I am, it's 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 personal for me. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm going to give that some thought. So that's just uh, something I'm pondering personally. I uh, hope to have Gary on back on in the future if he comes out with another book that uh, we think that would benefit all of you. Thank you to our sponsors who are small business owners themselves, and they care about your success. 
Club Capital, Coach B Consulting, Autopilot Recruiting, and of course, Direct Clicks. Visit them, go to their websites that can help you and to be able to grow your small business themselves. You want to understand how to manage the finances in your business at a, at a, at a, at a better way that work with all the insurance agency, a lot of the insurance agency owners around the country. You're going to want to just at least book a demo with somebody on the Club Capital team. Go to club.capital. They've got all the information on the website that you need just to be able to take that step and jump on a call with someone. Obviously, using that and getting those financials helps you to be able to make better decisions about bringing someone on. Can I afford to pay people more as Gary and I talked about? Can I bump up salaries to be to stay competitive? Can I be, you know, with my wages, et cetera? What does that look like? Well, those type of decisions you're making as a small business owner about how much profit do you have to be able to to invest um, in, in somebody else and also just be, being able to pay your, your team more. Well, that all comes down to affecting your financials. Um, and if you're going to make that investment, then uh, you want to be able to get some great players on. Go to Autopilot Recruiting so that they can do, you can out, outsource the recruiting on a regular basis to be able to find some top talent for you and your team. I get testimonials from David all the time around the success not only has he been able to have in his own offices, but also the success that the people that are learning from him and his team are having. And I think that's that's the mark. I mean, you might be able to do something, but are you able to transfer that knowledge in a way that helps other people that they're then having success? And that's, David sends me testimonials all the time from the things that he's, uh, that his clients and his um, uh, members are being able to to have based on the things and lessons that they're learning from him. You want to give him a test drive, let him know that you heard about him on the Club Capital Leadership Podcast, and he'll give you your entire first month off. Go to coachpconsulting.com. You know, another investment you're making is obviously in the leads that you provide to your sales team and the presence that you need to be able to have and want to have online. I mean, in the podcast, Gary talked about, hey, it's just kind of a table stakes at this point that you got to be online. So you know you need to do that, but you want to work with a company that's reputable, knows your business, go to directclicksinc.com. So thankful for our podcast partners to be able to have great guests like Gary Young. All right, everyone, till next episode, lead well. Thanks, team. 